NATO is getting creative in devising strategies to keep Western weapons flowing to Ukraine. Even if Donald Trump is elected president, Trump has stated if he wins the presidency, he is willing to pull the plug on support for Ukraine. The latest proposal would move a U.S.-led group that coordinates shipments of weapons to Ukraine to NATO command. This is one of many new proposals that could help maintain the flow of arms to Zelensky if Trump retakes the White House and as an American First movement divides a Republican caucus with very thin margins and a distaste for foreign spending. The proposal will come up for discussion today and tomorrow at the NATO foreign minister meeting in Brussels this week. Political reports that the goal is to finalize a plan at the NATO Leader Summit in July. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has signed a law expanding the country's draft age, intending to bulk up the Ukrainian military. The law lowers the country's minimum conscription age from 27 to 25, which could increase the number of men available to fight in its war against Russia. All right. What do you make of this? This is a really interesting political moment we're in. I'm continually shocked that the energy for kind of an anti-interventionist approach here or a, what do you, I mean, we could call it a kind of an isolationist approach, depending on your politics, is really coming from the Republican Party. But it is a divided Republican Party on this issue, with the overwhelming majority being establishment actors who, like the overwhelming majority of Democrats, desperately want to continue the flow of money uh, in um, weapons aid to Ukraine. Now, we talked with Professor Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia yesterday about the kind of utility of that project, and I encourage people to listen to that interview. His take is basically that it serves to prolong the war, cause there to be more death and immiseration of Ukrainian soldiers. You're seeing that there is an effort to lower the conscription age because of a a, a, a running out, frankly, of bodies to throw at this conflict without there being a prioritization of negotiation. So the idea that the country is now going to do an in run around the obstruction to Ukraine aid by basically offshoring the decision making, does it strike you as undemocratic? Yeah, yeah, it does, Brie. It does strike me as undemocratic. <laughs> and that's the point, right? I mean, they're doing it to get around a potential Trump presidency that would see Ukraine aid shuttered. And I think it's interesting that it actually took Trump this long to come out and say it, because it's obviously where his base is. And uh, the first time that we actually heard that Trump would not send another dollar to Ukraine was from Viktor Orban, the mm -hmm. Hungarian uh, president, or prime minister, rather, um, who came out and said that in an interview. And then and Trump sort of tacitly confirmed it afterwards. But the Republican Party in Congress is very much split on this issue. You have Speaker Johnson in the House, who has been very skeptical of continuing funding the Ukrainian war, but has now floated some sort of alternative, creative ideas for ways to continue to give them money. So he either wants to give them a loan, or he wants to fund it with uh, money that's been seized from Russian oligarchs who are on the sanctions list. And I don't think that really the Freedom Caucus and really the conservative base wants to do either of those things, even though it's, I guess, slightly better than just continuing to yeah, I mean, them it, give them weapons? It's slightly it's, better from a, I'm thinking of America's pocketbook sort of scenario, but it's not any better from a democracy scenario, right. especially if you're like Jeffrey Sachs, where the issue isn't kind of a um, kind of libertarian or conservative desire just to save money. It's because you genuinely believe, like, giving this money is prolonging a war mm -hmm. and the immiseration of the people of Ukraine. Um, Talk to me a little bit about what's going on and whether, uh, with, with Mike Johnson and whether or not this particular conflict is putting him in the crosshairs. Marjorie Taylor Greene put him on notice a week or so ago. Do you think there's any real chance that he might be facing an ouster just like Kevin McCarthy over this exact issue? I don't think so. I don't think most of the party has the appetite to go through what they went through with mm. trying to replace McCarthy. It turned into such a cluster for them that... I just don't see it happening a second time. But that being said, I mean, it only takes one person to actually file the motion to vacate. Marjorie Taylor Greene basically presented it but didn't go through the formal process to launch that trigger mechanism for an actual vote. And so she's kind of leaving it there on the table as like a pot shot warning sign. 
But in response, Speaker Johnson then put her on the impeachment manager's list mm. for the Mayorkas impeachment as sort of an olive branch. Um, but then she's still sort of trashing him in interviews. So I don't know how well exactly that worked. Um, I, one of the troubling things about the way that the establishment on both sides has been trying to move through the Ukraine funding is by coupling it with Israel and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And of course, Taiwan is something that everyone sort of universally agrees on in Congress should be funded. And that's sort of languishing because they want to package all of these things together. And the idea is you'll have pro-Israel Republicans and Democrats feel like they have to vote for the huge package, even if they don't want to fund Ukraine. And then on the other side, you have people who want to fund Ukraine but don't want to fund Israel, feeling like, oh, we get better vote for it to help the Ukrainians. And instead, what's been happening is everyone hates it. Uh, they haven't been able to basically turned it into a hold your nose and vote for it type situation. Then you have Mitch McConnell, by the way, who is stepping down from leadership in the Senate, but just gave an interview saying he's going to stay in his seat until his term is up, mostly because he wants to make sure that he can get Republicans to continue to fund Ukraine. Yeah, it does seem like a fool's errand, because did we just go through this with Ukraine funding and the immigration bill? Wasn't the grand bargain supposed to be that Democrats were going to bend the knee and put forward a much more conservative immigration bill than they ever would have agreed to otherwise in exchange for getting this foreign aid funding? And it just didn't fly. And I really kind of, I, I respect the kind of focus on wanting single issue bills to be put forward, which was part of the conversation around the first round of Kevin McCarthy the uh, speakership jostling for exactly this reason, not only because it, you know, it, it provides cover really strategically in a way that I think undermines uh, the relationship between voter desires and what Congress members actually do when they can hide behind the idea, well, I had to vote for this because look at this other priority. That is an age old excuse for voting for any number of policies that not are, are only kind of subjectively bad, but it just aren't popular in the in the broader sphere. And it's an incredible thing to witness how clear the public public's agenda is on this issue versus how rarely that perspective is reflected among Congress members. We talk about there being this kind of uh, anti-war slash isolationist slash America first cohort among the Republican Party, but we have to remember that it's a very small number of people and their power is outsized right now because of the thin margins in the House. The reality is that there's a bipartisan establishment effort to want all of this funding to go out the door. With the respect to Israel, we've seen Joe Biden go around Congress by issuing monthly um, weapons grants to Israel that don't require congressional approval. And the priorities are clear. He doesn't seem to care how upset people are at him. He doesn't care about these uncommitted campaigns. He doesn't care that, frankly, polls are showing that he's very likely to lose this election. The foreign aid funding really does seem to come first. And what's so troublesome with that divide that you're talking about of this sort of establishment blob and the small vocal minority of people who don't want to continue to funnel all of this foreign aid to unwinnable wars or shadow wars is that the American populace is on the side of the vocal minority. Yes. I mean, polls consistently show yes. that people want to stop funding Ukraine and support for pulling funding from Israel grows every single day as they continue their offensive into Gaza. And so you just have this fundamental disconnect between the people in Congress and the American people who just aren't getting what they're voting for on a pretty consistent, regular basis. Yeah. Well, I do hope we have some debates because as much as I know how Trump is signaling on this, I would like to get him to commit on the record as to what he would do differently than Joe Biden in a funding uh, context because more often than not, when people are off the pan campaign trail and in the Oval Office, they tend to very much align with the uh, blob consensus on these issues. Stick around, we have more Rising for you coming up next.